Good morning. My name is Dr. Hussain. We will talk about hungry bone syndrome. So let's define hungry bone syndrome first. It's one of the rare complications of the parathyroid surgical procedure done for the parathyroid adenomas or carcinomas. And as the name indicates, it usually means the bones are very hungry. So they need a lot of calcium and phosphate. So when the parathyroid hormone is gone, they try to capture as much calcium and phosphate and as quickly as possible. So this leads to a rapid prolonged and often very severe hypocalcemia in a patient who underwent with a parathyroid surgery. It, it also has low phosphate and low magnesium for the same reason. Normally the post of people, patient with a parathyroid surgery, they may have hypocalcemia, but it usually is mild and lasts for only for three to four days. However, when it starts persisting more than four days and it's severe, it's causing symptomatic, and it's not resolving, that's an indicator that you are dealing with hungry bone syndrome. The incidence, as I said, is variable, but it's here. It's reported to be 25 to 80 percent in the patients who have a radiographic evidence due to the parathyroid bone disease. It's quite low, zero to six percent in cases without radiographic bone changes of the parathyroid disease. And it's declining in the West due to early diagnosis and management of the parathyroid adenoma. What makes the bone hungry? That's the question. So what are the risk factors for hungry bone syndrome? One of those is the parathyroid bone changes on the, on the bone imaging, which shows that a lot of calcium and phosphate has been removed when the parathyroid was overactive and it was working on the bones. So the changes like osteoarthritis, fibrosa cystica, subcortical bone erosions, demineralization, and osteoporosis, they are the risk factors. Second important risk factor is a duration of the hyperparathyroidism. So longer is the duration, the more calcium would have been removed from the bones and the bones would be more hungry. Old age is also a risk factor for hungry bone syndrome. And that's due to the age-related reduction in one alpha hydroxylase activity in the kidneys. Also, they have low bone mass and low body reserves compensate for the low calcium. If there's a parathyroid associated kidney disease, that will also contribute to the problem. High PTH level and the volume or bulk of the parathyroid adenoma usually correlates with, with the hungry bone syndrome. And if it's more than two grams, that's really significant. Parathyroid related chronic kidney disease will also contribute to the hypocalcemia. Preoperative level of vitamin D is, is another important risk factor. Those people who have low preoperative risk, a low preoperative level of vitamin D, they're at high risk. Why it happens? So one of the reason is, as I said, is high PTH exposure to the bones, excessive demineralization due to the increased osteoclastic activity, increased resorption pits and resorption surface area of the bones. Hence the bones become hungry, rather they're starving. Sudden loss, on, on background of this, when there's a parathyroid surgery and there's a sudden drop in the PTH level below normal, so now the osteoclasts have lost the basic stimulus which they were using to, for increased activity. So when the PTH is gone after the surgery, the osteoclastic activity would suddenly stop. And now the supply of the calcium which was coming from the bone will go in a reverse fashion. And now the calcium will start depositing in the bone. When, when there's loss of PTH from the blood, the hormone level goes down. There's also increased osteoblastic activity of the bones at the same time. And there have been studies that there is 10 to 15% of increase in the bone density within a month if you, if you repeat the bone scan, bone density scan uh, after the surgery. The remaining parathyroid glands, they should ideally compensate, but they may not be, they are often not able to compensate in the hungry bone syndrome because of the multiple reasons. One of the reasons could be intentional or unintentional surgical removal of those parathyroid glands, which, which were normal. Second, even if they are not removed, they could have been damaged during, during the surgical procedure, or there could have been a vascular ischemia or vascular damage to these glands. Another important factor is that those glands they have been suppressed for quite long time. So they usually become atrophic. So they are not able to resume their function quickly within, within days. 
So it usually will take longer time for them to come back if they're structurally and vascularly intact. On top of that, if the parathyroid has affected the kidneys and there's a parathyroid related bone uh, kidney disease causing chronic kidney disease, chronic renal failure with low vitamin D production and hypocalcemia, that certainly will, certainly will contribute to the uh, risk of hungry bone syndrome. Low vitamin D preoperatively Will, in, will certainly be another risk factor. And it, it means that patients who have hyperparathyroidism, if they're adequately repleted with a vitamin D level, they have a low chance of going into hungry bone syndrome. But remember, hungry bone syndrome can still happen despite the normal vitamin D level. So it, it's not a guarantee that it will not happen. Why the hypocalcemia would give you the symptoms? So remember the mechanism of how hypocalcemia causes symptoms is calcium competes with the sodium. All these cations, calcium, magnesium, hydrogen, they compete with, the, with sodium at the neuronal and at the muscular level. And the action of tension in the muscles and in the neurons and in most of the body tissues is generated by the sodium influx. So if there's any competition which is competing with the sodium, the influx of the sodium will reduce and the electrical activity of those organs will be reduced. When this, there is a loss of competition, when there's hypocalcemia or hypomagnesemia or alkalosis, this loss of competition with the sodium, and now the sodium influx into the neurons and into the skeletal muscle will increase. And that will cause excessive depolarization and increased electrical activity of these tissues. Second, calcium is also needed for the physical contraction of the muscles, for the skeletal muscles and as well as for the cardiac muscle. Remember the cardiac action tension, cardiac muscle action tension is also dependent on the serum calcium level. So the, the ST segment of the, of the ECG or the QT part of the ECG is dependent on the potassium, potassium and calcium moment. So patient with hypocalcemia they will, they will have a prolonged uh, plateau phase or the prolonged action potential causing prolonged QT syndrome as well. Thirdly, because the physical mechanical contraction of the myocardium is dependent upon the serum level of the calcium, so hypocalcemia can cause transient ventricular dysfunction leading to heart failure, which is reversible when you replace the calcium level. So patient can have symptoms of heart failure. Remember, low phosphate can, will also give you a lot of symptoms. Phosphate is needed for the energy for production, especially the ATP. If you look at the ATP, AC ATP is a, a adenosine triphosphate. So there are three phosphates in one single molecule of ATP. So that means to make ATP, you need a lot of phosphate. If there's a severe deficiency of the phosphate, cells will not be able to generate ATP. And when they can't generate ATP, they will not work. This can actually lead to physical death of the cells. So, Severe hypophosphatemia can actually cause acute hepatic necrosis and it can also cause acute rhabdomyolysis in addition to the muscle weakness and in addition to the dysfunction of the other organs. So hypophosphatemia associated with these uh, hungry bone syndrome is also a, is a significant clinical risk. Not only the calcium, but phosphate also matters a lot. Similarly, magnesium is same as calcium. It behaves same as calcium on the electrical excitable tissues. It competes with the sodium. So loss of magnesium because of hypoparathyroidism will cause increased excitability at the neuromuscular tissues. Clinical signs symptoms, as we have already elaborated the pathophysiology, neuromuscular irritability, muscle twitching, muscle cramps, muscle weakness, ne neuronal symptoms like tingling, numbness, paresthesia, especially the perioral paresthesia, chivistic signs. If you tap on the on the on the on the facial nerve, there will be facial twitching, chavistic sign, and trosseur sign, which is like if you inflate the blood pressure cuff on the forearm, on the arm, and keep it inflated above systolic blood pressure, patient will have carpopedal spasm of the of the hand. That's trosseur sign. <clears throat> the ECG can also show prolonged QT, and the patient may also have muscle weakness, and patient can also have uh, symptoms of heart failure. Extremely low calcium level less than 1.3 is very likely to cause 
too much irritability of the neurons leading to the seizures like activity or coma. And sometimes this coma can also lead to death. Cardiac arrhythmias, especially due to prolonged QT intervals, such as torsade, uh, broad chorus ventricular tachycardia is another risk factor. Lab testing, calcium level will be low as expected. Phosphate is often low and magnesium is also low because of the deposition in the bones. Vitamin D level in most of the patients will be low unless it has been replaced preoperatively. This is because of loss of stimulation for the production of vitamin D. Vitamin D conversion in the kidneys from D2 to into D3 is dependent upon the PTH level. Renal functions and thyroid functions should also be checked because renal function, CKD will contribute to hypocalcemia and other biochemical parameters and thyroid dysfunction can also cause hypocalcemia. Alkaline phosphatase usually stays high. In these patients, it was high previously because of the fact that because of uh, bone disease, and now it will be high because of the bone synthesis. Bone density will increase if we check for that. Course, usually it lasts for a few weeks to few months, but it has been reported when, there, when the, it lasts up to nine months or even more than a year. It stabilizes once the bone synthesis slows down and bone starvation is over. So basically once the bones are, bone's tummy is full, it will settle down. Death can also happen because of the cardiac arrhythmias or neurological complications of the seers or coma. Seers can cause bone fracture because these patients have brittle bones because of the parathyroid bone disease. If they get uncontrolled seers, they're at high risk of bone fractures as well. Prevention, pre-op vitamin D replacement, especially for those with low levels, can help prevent hungry bone syndrome, but certainly it's not 100%. It will help. Bisphosphonates have, has a controversial role if because they block osteoclastic activity, so they can prevent the bones to go into the phase of hunger or starvation if they are used for a long period before operation. However, if they are used shortly just before the procedure, they may actually contribute to the hungry bone syndrome and increase it. Early diagnosis and management of the parathyroid adenoma with a biochemical normalization and the, and is usually one of the major contributed to prevent the risk for uh, hungry bone syndrome. Treatment certainly depends upon the severity and clinical manifestation. Patients should be hospitalized and patients should be kept under in a high dependency unit with a cardiac venator on to prevent the cardiac arrhythmias. Replacing the calcium is important, both oral and IV. Oral calcium is usually given in high doses like a six to 12 grams if tolerated per day. Maximum calcium is available from the calcium carbonate preparation, which gives you 40 or 50 percent of the calcium. Rest the other calcium preparation, they, they have less like 20 percent or 30 percent calcium availability. IV calcium is often needed for acute manifestation, especially for arrhythmias and especially for neurological manifestation or severe calcium deficiency when the oral is not tolerated. But certainly, IV calcium should be given through the large veins to prevent the venous irritability and thrombophlebitis, and also it should be given slowly to prevent the cardiac arrhythmias and other issues. Vitamin D3, D3 should be replaced. D2 is not work, going to work because there's no PTH in the body now. A patient need a high dose of vitamin D3. Magnesium replacement is also crucial, and so is the phosphate, both oral and IV. Thank you very much. These are the references for, for the presentation. I'll be more than happy to take questions. Thanks.